she got with the help from her own daughter. She was also helping to surprise her. Helping to what? She was also helping to surprise her. Because their marriage was going to save their financial situation. Well, yes, yes, that's right. Uh, actually, there were several reasons, I think, for Anna's, Anna Moore's not telling her mother. And I, I didn't find that uh, uh, in the least objectionable. Uh, I mean, I could understand this. I have uh, heard of uh, similar situations. The, one, the possibility that a premature, uh, premature announcement of the news uh, might adversely affect uh, uh, Sanderson. Two, uh, the fact that uh, the breaking the news at that moment it might uh, affect her mother very badly, and free the surprise, the idea of uh, surprise when the moment was right, you see. Uh, that, that to me, was entirely believable. The, um, what, I think that what makes and has made people feel that Anna Moore was stupid was her total failure to appraise the character of Lennox Sanderson. See. Well, that long before any mock marriage came into the story. I mean, this, what kind of a guy is this, you know? And here was the simple, pure, innocent little country girl who visits the fashionable apartment uh, of this cad and is impressed with the apartment, especially with the music box. Incidentally, Herb Stern, to this day, has the music box. He has it in his apartment in Hollywood. It's a, it's a bit of memento. <laughs> you know, he's been offered money for this. <laughs> and during a very lean year out there, too. And he wouldn't sell it for $10,000. <laughs> Can you imagine the music box and the, that prop in the, in the set there? Yes. Um, one of the, the strange aspects of her character seems to be there's like a, a shadow of gold diggers. Well, no. It's like, it, it, I mean, it's not, it doesn't come through, you know, the, the way with, in her actions, particularly when you put the story together, you, say, you remember that she's come to Boston, I guess it is, for money. Because you know, because she had to have these financial troubles. And then she agrees to marry him and she's in his apartment and she sees this place of lives, which is really very far out looking on the street. Yeah. It, it looks very, really ritzy. And, uh, and then she agrees to marry him and then, and then she goes home and there's some title about, um, um, she, she hints to her mother that their financial worries are over, you know. And it's, just, it's not, you know, I'm not saying that this is supposed to be a conscious thing on her part, part of her personality, but it's strange. Now, did you hear? Did you hear these comments? Uh, what is your name, please? Peg. Peg. Uh, Peg made the comment uh, that she finds uh, an aspect of gold diggerism in the character of Anna Moore. That Anna Moore comes to Boston uh, for money, and uh, that when she returns uh, to the country home, she tells her mother that uh, their financial worries are over. Now, uh, I must. Uh, take exception to this interpretation for the following reasons. Uh, they are practically penniless, Anna and her mother. The mother <coughs> is responsible for Anna's trip to Boston. The mother sends Anna to Boston to appeal to wealthy relatives, please to help. The mother is ailing. And it's quite obvious from the nature of their existence that their means uh, of earning any money at all are extremely limited. This is a reflection on the economic bankruptcy of rural America, uh, where the uh, denizens were barely able to eke out a living, and this condition had obtained for centuries, even before the United States was formed as a nation. I mean, how and with what are they going to earn a living? In, in, uh, in, in the rural regions. Uh, they have practically no facilities of any kind. And when Anna comes to Boston at her own mother's insistence, needless to say, she's impressed. She's overawed by the splendor and the wealth, 
this is a very human trait. Uh, she is, uh, after all, she's, she has not been uh, brought up in a, in a convent uh, with the idea of renouncing the world and rejecting its, its riches. And uh, for the first time, probably, in her life, uh, when she enters the, the home of her wealthy cousin, uh, she gets a, a square meal. Just a good meal. Probably a rarity. They probably lived on uh, potato spuds most of the week. Uh, you said the film shows up like the... Uh the meanest of small town life. Well, now, this is, this is what I'm coming to. This is what I'm coming to. You see, the girl, the girl is a victim. And she is not a very bright person. Uh, for that matter, most of the characters, I would say, in all of Griffith's films are basically, at least from my point of view, very stupid people. And, uh, uh, this is, uh, I think, a measure of their uh, great emotional appeal. That uh, you feel that, well, if we were all as stupid as that, if we could make ourselves as stupid as that, there might actually be less trouble in the world. <laughs> you know, I, I don't mean that, I don't mean to say that we are, uh, we have any right to pin any bouquets of intelligence on ourselves. But the, the kind of stupidity represented by uh, the characters in Griffith's films is the, uh, the stupidity of, uh, of people who not only do not challenge a vicious system, uh, but I think are also incapable of creating one. Uh, this uh, level of intelligence is, is below the sewer and uh, is the subject for a special study. You would have to go through the whole range of product. Uh, the, uh, the one, the only one that I have found yet well, I'd say almost the only one anyway, uh, from whom I found it possible to have great respect, was the bum in the idol dancer, the beachcomber, the, uh, <laughs> the dropout from the whole society who spends all of his time moaning and groaning up and down the beach there in the South Seas, or, or no, it isn't the South Seas, it's the, uh, the Caribbean, the Caribbean region, and uh, who, uh, Amid drinks, uh, makes no bones of his utter contempt of uh, human society and of the whole civilized world. And, uh, there, at last, is a, the glimmering of thought, <laughs> the beginning of the most dangerous disease, and, and mental analysis. You know? <laughs> and, uh, no, but these people, the people in, in uh, the village, the village of Belden and, uh, and the other village, the, the, uh, the community, uh, the, and, uh, and these, remember, form the, the bulk of the cast of Way Down East. I think these people are, are, are mean and narrow, and extremely bigoted, and uh, very often downright hateful. Except I wonder you know, if, uh, if I think a group is presenting them as the good people as a place where, you know, where the truths are and the city as the evil place. And I think, you know, I think the, the film is like a, uh, uh, like a big uh, clinging to some dream of, uh, of uh, country life as the real place and the city as the evil place, even though the cities in 1920 and earlier than that, much earlier than that, were war getting the people, just, you know, for the reasons you said, they had to make a living, whatever it is. Oh, and yes. They, they wanted, you know, they wanted some semblance of life. Uh, of intellectual like activity. So the people walk going there, and, and here is a sentimental thing about the countries where the truths are. Well, did you hear what Ken said? That he thinks that Griffith uh, tried to portray uh, uh, the country folk, uh, the, the, the folk uh, of down east, as, as, as basically uh, benevolent and, and innocent and kind, uh, and, uh, and that the, uh, he also tried to project the, the city or the people of the city. Uh, as uh, basically evil and, and uh, scheming and, and, and so on. There is no question about it. There is absolutely no question about it that Griffith was very fond of these people. Even when he showed, showed some of them in a, in a bad light, uh, he did it with a certain kindliness of touch. 
uh, almost as though he was apologizing for them and uh, or scolding them as the way uh, in the way that you would a, a naughty child, but with no uh, no feeling of judgment. And I feel that this is terribly wrong on Griffith's part. Terribly wrong because for my money, these are not good people. These are not good people at all. These are the people who later formed the lynch mobs and became the rednecks. And these are the people who support one war after another without asking any questions, making any challenges, and, and the people who support any form of, of economic exploitation. And because it is established, because it is in power, therefore, according to them, it is good. And this I would never accept in this life or the alleged other one. Also, it's true that the people of the city were, were slickers. Uh, still, they are not really represented by Lennox Sanderson. Lennox Sanderson is simply a heel. He is an individual heel. Well, the people at the party are you know, trying to get engaged in, in idle social revolution. Well, these people at the party are of the upper set, the upper social set, and they're filthy with money and don't know what to do with them, their money or their time or their lives, you know, so that we don't really see uh, the run-of-the-mill people of the city. We don't see just, just the average flow of, of urban humanity. Well, I, I wonder, you know, if Griffith wasn't as uh, you know, stupid in a, in a certain kind of way as the girl in the movie, uh, if, if, he, if he wasn't really, you know, projecting this kind of uh, dream for this kind of mentality that he shared it. Oh, absolutely. There's no question about it. I Certainly, I mean, commercially, uh, you know, it's certainly because, but the point is that Griffith belonged to an older America, an America that was already beginning to break up uh, when he first appeared, except that they, it was still the predominant America, and, and the breaking up process takes a long time. It took another half century. As a matter of fact, uh, most of it is still here. Look at the Deep South. Look at the Midwest uh, heartland, what is nowadays referred to as Middle America. For us, these are places of horror. Binghamton, you have it good here. You are, you are living in, a, in, a, uh, in an atmosphere of, uh, of unbridled liberality and flexible freedom and, and goodwill with uh, maybe an occasional burp from some, uh, <laughs> some demented old biddy, but, uh, but you have it good here in Binghamton. This is nothing. <laughs> God forbid if you ever transplanted to the heartland of the Midwest, the Deep South, or for that matter, to the rural regions, for example, of California or Arizona, you wouldn't be in business for one week. Not for a week. The, the, the vigilantes would uh, wrap it up for you. And, uh, you know, and these, they, they come right out of the people, right out of the nexus of the people. And uh, this is the America that, that Griffith uh, projected onto the screen. Uh, Consider, for example, the, well, you haven't seen this, this one. Uh, there is one, one uh, uh, film of rural America, greater than way down east. The, the film is, itself is not greater, but the, the portrait of rural America is out of this world. It should be preserved forever. It, I tell you, it's a, it, it, it is so profoundly authentic that it's, uh, it has, again, that newsreel quality, and and without the melodrama uh, of way down east too, you see that makes it a little, uh, you know, a little I think a little more useful from a from a sociological standpoint. This is in a film called The Greatest Question. It was filmed in the Smoky Mountains, and I, here I, I tell you that the, the the people in the, in this film uh, are, are the people who are really uh, the mainspring. Uh, you, you, well, they are the, certainly the mainspring of, of the Vietnam War. They are the mainspring of the Korean War. Uh, they are main, the mainspring of all and any censorship that ever existed in this land, you see. And, uh, the mainspring of things that make it possible to be Well, they are the mainspring. The, it is their morality, their mythology, uh, that represents uh, the... Uh, the acceptable or socially accepted line of the United States. And uh, this is too bad uh, uh, because from a, it's too bad in a way that, that I didn't order that film, except that uh, from a technical standpoint, uh, it's, it's, 
not nearly as important as way down east. From a sociological and historic standpoint, it is. Is there a greater complication in the view of the rural people? Like the squire uh, and his wife seem to be, um, when they cause trouble, he at least want, she, she tells them to go and check out whether this is really true, and they have to kind of turn it uh, at the end. Well, well, I find these other characters, uh, like the gossip and the guy who, uh, and, uh, who who's always chasing her, and these two people who uh, kiss each other at the end, you know, this, uh, the, the, they, they seem to be presented you know, as truly disgusting people. Well, they seem disgusting to us, but that, that brings up another, uh, an, another aspect of, of the, uh, the point that I think that Peg raised before. You see, you notice, you remember at the end, in the double wedding, there's a, a bit of horseplay and humor, or intended humor, and uh, Griffith uh, spoofs uh, characters like the gossip. And I very well recall that even long ago, uh, when I was just starting out, uh, I emotionally and instinctively resented this because I felt that the, that the gossip is a, is, is a downright vicious, a criminally vicious individual. And this was the point at which Griffith would have been fully justified to pass a judgment, some kind of judgment. Instead of which, he simply spoofs her and uh, makes light of her and presents her at the end as a, uh, a comic and very likable character after all, and she is not. She is not. This, this woman created damage uh, that could easily have resulted in tragedy in real life undoubtedly would have resulted in tragedy uh, the people like the gossip of way down east as played by vivia ogden have driven thousands of girls to their deaths they have driven them to suicide have driven them to i forgot what i think <laughs> I, I think that the, um, this, the, the figure of this guy um, with, with the goatee chasing the gossip all those years, and finally, you know, his marriage thing in which, you know, she reaches down for the handkerchief and he kisses then this other equally, you know, grotesque character that um, there's a real, that I find in, in this film especially, but in other Christmas films, including Birth of a Nation and, and all, all of those films I know, a horror of, of sexuality uh, in, the, in the film, so that the romance, you know, involving always you know, this innocent um, heroine, uh, she, she's always victimized, you know, by these grotesque lust, either you know, these these lustful, power-hungry figures, or or, 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 or else you know, surrounded, or in the same film, also surrounded by by these characters who are you know, true sexual grotesque. And, you know, I, I feel that that's a very important part of this, of this film and, and makes this, um, even the hero, when, when, when we first see him, you know, he's dreaming, uh, and, then, and then there's this kind of masculine world of play, you know, like in, in Birth of a Nation, it's the military, you know, comradeship. There, you know, just at, at the point where she goes to bed with Lennox Sanderson, there's a fade out, at least in this print, and it cuts to whatever his name, Tom, or, you know, the character. David. They're out in the field, you know, sort of romping around, you know, with the other boy laborers. And, you know, whenever, whenever male-female sexuality enters, as far as I know, in, in all of the Griffith films, it's, it's always, you know, this grotesque, it's either anti or unse totally unsexual, or it's sexual harm. Larry, first, I have been ruined all my life by the girls of America. And as a result, uh, I find it quite impossible now, and I found it quite impossible back in 1920, to associate even the remotest degree of sexuality with the gossip of Way Down East as played by Vivia Ogden. Uh, for me, this is a 100% creep, this character. It has nothing to do with sex. This is the living embodiment 
in a crude rural form of the word taboo on life itself, all life, a really malignant character. But what makes her and the, uh, the, uh, the, farm, uh, the farmer who pursues her uh, what, and, and, and several other characters in the film, what makes uh, the gossip and the other characters seem grotesque to us is that Griffith uh, portrays them affectionately and, and humorously and, it, and, and you actually uses them in the picture for what used to be called comic relief. They're supposed to be comedy characters. And there was a name, a, a word that still is heard uh, in the deeper rural regions of America, uh, a word that is still heard uh, in application to characters uh, like the, uh, the farmer who pursues the gossip. Uh, they still are, and they always were known as rubes, the, the, the country rubes, you see. And the, what, what offended me a long time ago was the fact that Griffith could portray such people uh, even, with an, even, even with an attempt at humor, lightly, when in fact they are outrageous persons really outrageous persons. Uh, uh, and the gossip herself is not innocent. She is not unaware of the damage that she's about to inflict uh, on, on another human being. And uh, by implication, she has already done plenty of inflicting around the countryside on other people who are not encompassed in this particular story. Ken. Uh, not only in this film, but in many of Griffith's films, if you don't agree with the picture he's projecting and reinforcing an American mentality, so that's true. Isn't that it? is correct. Including the birth of a nation. So that is correct. You know, the birth of a nation is a, is a different thing. Uh, I, I well, you're not sending you know, blacks to Africa. No, but this is, a, this is an Italian thing. This is a much more complex thing than appears on the surface. The way down east is uh, uh, relatively simple because it deals with, uh, with what. Uh, uh, spokesmen uh, always like to refer to as the backbone of America. This is the silent majority of America in the rural setting. I think it's the same story. You see? I no. It's the same, well, it's the same, it's the same social... Uh, yes, in, in a sense. But, but consider this. Consider this, because this, this, is, this is where we come, come to grips with it now. Uh, regardless of whether Anna Moore uh, was a stupid girl or not, suppose she was not and still was taken in. But this happens to everyone. It can happen to every one of us. She's taken in in a different uh, one or another setting. The fact remains that she is a genuine victim. In that sense, she is innocent. She is a victim of the morality of that community, the, the, the community of all of New England, which in effect represents the morality of America itself, of the whole nation. And that, 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 that morality, for my money, is, is of the essence of barbarism. The girl is cheated, she is deceived, she is lied to, she is so stunned on discovering uh, uh, the force of, that in the beginning she can't even react to it. I mean, she can't even believe it. And as it unravels, it, it comes out that uh, she, is supposed to, uh, in, in the common vernacular of our time, she is supposed to take the rap for this outrage. Why should she? Within, within the morality, because within the morality of the film, within Griffith's morality, she's guilty, even though she was innocent. This is not and Griffith's morality, that's my point. This is not Griffith's morality. Griffith was being absolutely authentic in projecting this as the, as the morality of the American people, and this is the morality of a primitive tribe, and the roots, the roots of that morality go deep down into the church and go back hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years. And this brings us to the brink of the, the, the issue of religion in relation to cinema. And this, this should come after the coffee break. But within, but within, the, within the morality, she's, she's guilty. guilty. Had she not had the long marriage, then she would, according to Griffith, and according to the townspeople, and according to herself, have been worthy of, of being, you know, considered immoral and not given a job, etc., etc. Had the mock marriage not made her the innocent one, 
you know, had she slept with him without marrying him and had the child, she would be considered, you know, really awful, guilty, horrible. She, she, she was guilty on. because she allowed herself to be seduced, because just as the film says, <coughs> men, men are allowed to sow their wild Well, girls. yes, exactly. Of course, I tell you, uh, I, will never, I will never accept that morality. Yeah, it's a double standard. Oh, well, this is a double standard. The double standard. Furthermore, I, you, you, of course, you're right. This is the double standard, and this is the classic presentation of it for all time. And I will add that the stupidity, the stupidity of which the male species has long been guilty uh, from the Stone Age right on down, is in failing to see that if the woman is enslaved, the male is enslaved too, in the same respect in which a jailer who claps handcuffs uh, around a prisoner uh, is thereby enslaved by inversion uh, by and to the prisoner. And the only way he can free himself is to let the prisoner go, you see. But you explain this. Explain this, for example, to the rednecks and to the American Legionnaires that they'll <laughs> of, 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 but they don't want you to you make a fight on your hands. You know. First of all, they don't want freedom. They don't want freedom. Exactly. Also, also exactly. Way, That's exactly what they don't want. It's exactly the point. And I, I arrived at this conclusion some time back with the conclusion that the American people don't want freedom. You know? They don't actually do not want it. And, but the rhetoric of freedom is the dust in everyone's eyes. This was the reason, a part of the reason, translated in, in the political terms, that I contended uh, during the, uh, the Johnson administration that it would be better to wipe out the whole Democratic Party administration, let the Republicans take over, and wear a hard hat for protection, because you from the Republican Party you can never expect anything but repression and, and blood but that at least it would then be clear for all to see that the, the rules, even the rules, could then see it. Because the, yes, because the reality then uh, would have uh, uh, broken down the walls of rhetoric. The rhetoric goes over on the other side. That's why we've had four wars in this century today, all of them under a Democratic Party administration. Because the Democratic Party is, is the master of, uh, of rhetoric. The, uh, the solemnized rhetoric of the morality and mythology of, of American history and American life. You see, but, but for the same reason, you see, American people actually do not want freedom. They want to be led. But they will die before they will admit it. You see. Well, they like, they like, they like to talk about the failure of their lives, the misery of their lives. Of course, certainly. If they wanted freedom, no administration in charge of this country could. It could take a single one of their sons. Not one administration. The administration would be toppled, I tell you, practically overnight. And the, the leaders of it would be fleeing for their lives and begging for mercy. When they want something, I'm referring now to the American people, they know how to get it. Remember Prohibition? They violated the federal laws of Prohibition right and left all over the place. And finally, they had to wipe off the books. That aroused them. The business of war, the war does not arouse them at all. They see nothing wrong with this. Take their liquor away from them, and they will be fighting in the streets, and they will violate every law on the, on the statute books, every law on the land, and regardless of whether, whether one million policemen are, are towering over them or not, uh, when it comes to their pleasure, uh, they, can, they know how to take it. When it, when it comes to uh, abolishing the draft, or ending the war, they don't want to hear about it. They don't even want to discuss it. You know, get, get, getting back to way down east, I think that um, possibly Griffith, whether consciously or unconsciously, intended this complexity. I don't believe that, uh, given the kind of master he was, uh, you know, as all his films show, of manipulating not only the audience at that time, but manipulating us today, that I really believe that the, these views that we have of these rules, of these of marriage, of you know, the whole complexity of the thing, that we could really go on. And I think we we're going to start to get into that at some level, you know, Griffith was 
driven you know, by splits in his own feelings about, about things. And that it's all there in the film. Oh, he was. The, 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 the proof, you're right about this. I would go along with you on that, Larry, because the, the proof of the split is the entirely different approach uh, throughout intolerance. This is also the reason that intolerance remains to this day a favorite film of the young uh, dissidents of all of the Griffith films, despite the fact that uh, technically Certainly, certain the other films are more important. So, first of all, I, I, I would think that um, the country, uh, the, there ever was any kind of country tribal mores uh, as it was entered, the way least, that, 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 that village, those kind of people never existed. Oh, there was, no. all, there was always a fairy tale. Oh, no, no! This is, this, this is the standard village of America, for goodness sake. I don't believe it. Like, uh, even today, even no. today, there are millions of families I, in the world. I, I, it's got the girl, the girl... I think uh, it's a standard myth. Of, of no, the no, the girl, the girl either, either lets, uh, lets it be known to her mother or her father, or maybe the information somehow leaks out that she's pregnant, and she's told to pack her things and get out, and they, they, they don't even bother to investigate uh, you know, whether, whether this was of her own doing, or whether she wanted it this way, or, or but then, what? But then the goodness, something like the goodness of the squire is an exaggerated goodness, because if you went out of danger, then... It was the community, these self-righteous prints, these monstrosities of, of what is now known as the Judeo-Christian morality. Exactly. Even, even the people who dress as haters are exaggerated. She's the monstrosity also, uh, the victim. See, she, she's, not, she's not a victim because she's different. You mean Anna Moore? She just happens of to be. Of course, because she, she accepts their morality. Yeah. And, uh, she's a woman, remember? No, no she's not a woman. No, she's not a woman. She's not a woman. Hey, Ken is right to this. To this extent, she is victimized by the community and by its morality. And to this extent, uh, 